Yeah, warm well, welcome to our first evening in this STEAM course. My name is Bianca Hoffman. I develop projects at Fraunhofer Mavis to inspire people for science, such as this artist residency program named STEAM Imaging. It is an interdisciplinary exploration of digital medicine and the human body and jointly hosted with the Ars Electronica in Linz, Austria, in collaboration with the International Fraunhofer Talent School and the School Center in Walle, Bremen, and the UCLA Art Sci Center, Los Angeles, USA. Do I share the screen actually? Yes, you are sharing your screen. Everything's oh. fine. Okay, I don't have this green bar around it. So the STEAM course is part of the artist residency named STEAM Imaging, which I created together with my colleague Sabrina Hase in 2017, and which is happening for the third time. And this year's artist in residence is Elie Joteva, a Bulgarian intermedia artist and researcher based in Los Angeles. She earned her master in fine arts degree from UCLA Design Media Arts. Um, and is a member of the UCLA Art Sci Collective. We will speak during the following evenings in English because Ellie speaks no German, but Bulgarian and English. And however, do not hesitate to ask questions in the chat in German in the Q&A sessions, if you wish, we will translate them. So unser Ziel ist uh, wirklich mit euch ins Gespräch zu kommen. Und wenn ihr Fragen habt, könnt ihr die auch gerne in deutscher Sprache in den Chat schreiben und wir werden das dann übersetzen. The most important thing is for you to express your thoughts with no fear of being imperfect. This is an experiment and adventure for all of us, the scientists, the artists, and the students alike. And the STEAM course is one of the projects Fraunhofer Mavis is doing at the intersection of art and science. Tomorrow, we will show you a few more examples. So which professional disciplines and approaches we will explore? It's from anatomical drawing, computer science, digital medicine, mathematics, media art, science communication, and physics. And who is participating in our experiment? First of all, you, the school stu students from Esset Valle, and the artist uh, Eli Joteva, and scientists from Fraunhofer Mavis, namely the mathematicians Sabrina Haas and Hanne Ballhausen, who are in charge for the themed evenings. Myself and at our first themed evening, a colleague who is a radiologist and an artist, Susanne Diekmann. Now I will hand over to Sabrina, who will give you an overview of what you can do during our following themed evenings. Yeah. Hello and uh, welcome to the to this uh, experiment, uh, as Bianca called it. So on the first um, themed evening, which we will have on November 5th, we will have the topic of back to the bones, the human skeleton or what keeps us together. And what we, we will do in this evening is we will approach the human skeleton, for example, as a medical student, as a digital artist and motion designer, also as a scientist and as a draftsman. So having a, a view from different disciplines on this topic, yeah, on, the, on the topic of the human skeleton. On the second evening, you will have a quite, quite different topic. And, and in, this, um, uh, in this evening, we will have the, the topic from phantoms to avatars, analog and digital simulations for the body. Now you might wonder what phantoms are or what avatars are, and this we will explore on this evening. Yeah, we learn what models, maybe you have already heard about models, what models are used for in science and medicine. As for example, an animation artist or as a researcher, like we are in our institute at Ron for Mavis, or as Ellie is at, as an, an animation artist. Yeah, you will learn the art of photogrammetry, so we are really excited also about that and make your own 3D models from the objects which are around you. Yeah, this is followed by a more medical topic. Yeah, so what gets lost in the digital world? Maybe you have already heard about um, 
X-ray or computed tomography images or even magnetic resonance images. And we learn how, about how such digital images um, limitations on our perception and how, to, um, how we can use those images and how we work with them, for example, as medical students or doctors or clinicians, yeah. or as media artists, for example, for um, augmented reality immersive experiences. Yeah, this we will do on this evening. Followed by this basics on medical imaging we will learn how to approach the contents of those medical images. Yeah, we will explore, for example, the perception of color and the digital representation of images. And yeah, it's important, for example, for artists, yeah, clinicians, and also scientists. And what you can, can see from, also from the slides is we are approach, approaching each evening with very different views yeah, and from very different uh, disciplines. And the last evening will be getting real and how researchers and physicians work hand in hand. Yeah, we, we learn how arts as a communicative practice stimulates compassion and healing. And we will discuss the effects of new technology on us as a patient and on medical care with the artists, with the researchers and with an radiologist. Yeah, so the last thing evening is uh, um, yeah, uh, a summarizing evening where we can get all information into, uh, into this evening and discuss a lot about the effects of new technologies. Okay, with this I hand over again to Bianca. Okay, beside these themed evenings, we planned three virtual excursions with you to the Magnetic Resonance Imaging Laboratory from Fraunhofer Mewes, to the California Nanosystem Institute and Art Science Center, which is a great example of how science and art cooperate together, and to one of the world's most fascinating science center, the Ars Electronica Center in Linz, Austria. Um, as mentioned, this year's artist in residence is, um, uh, will explore the topic of digital medicine and the human body with us, and it's uh, Ellie. So she will work with us together. And besides these 10 evenings, she creates and develops her own artwork entitled Intra Being. And it is guided by questions, what lies within the bounds of being? How do our physical bodies and their virtual representations, such medical images, affect one another? And the project investigates the measuring and modeling capacities of medical imaging and simulation procedures. We have dedicated an evening to Ellie and her artwork in Trabeing and to discuss and learn more about her approach as an artist to digital medicine and to discuss your thoughts, questions and artistic ideas. And now it's my extraordinary pleasure to announce Victoria Wessner, an artist and professor at the UCLA Department of Design Media Arts and director of the Arts Science Center at the School of the Arts in California. Nanosystem Institute. She was trained as a painter at the University of Belgrade, but her curious mind took her on a path of experimental creative research residing between disciplines and technologies. And with her art and installations, she investigates how communication technologies affect collective behavior and perceptions of identity shift in relation to scientific innovations. Her work involves collaborations with composers, nanoscientists, neuroscientists, biologists, and she brings this experience to students like you. I'm looking forward very much to get more insights how and what art contributes to digital medicine. Victoria. Thank you so much. I'm actually so excited to be part of this. And as we're getting closer to it more and more, especially in this time where we're all quarantined and the pandemic is truly global and we're connected from all over. So I am in California, actually close to Palm Springs for a few days, which is in the desert. It's in the morning here. 
and we'll deal with the time zone. So most of the time it will be morning here when it's evening for you. And uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction to what we do or to the idea of the two cultures that we're trying to merge. So I'll share the screen and uh, give you a little short introduction. Here we go. So the Arts Eye Center was established in 2005. And when I first started the idea and connecting the campus, uh, which is uh, separated just like most of the places in the world, I'm sure it's true for you too. It was very hard to get people to come. It was hard to even convince people that this is a good idea, but we kept going. And now it seems to be the cool thing. Um, this is our campus map. And what you see here is the Broad Art Center, and then you have the California Nanosystems Institute. It takes about 15 minutes to walk from one side to the other side. And many times people would tell me that in 10, 20 years they've been working there, professors, they've never been to the art side or to the science side. And I, my goal began to geographically at least connect people. So it was really important to have two locations and to have people physically meet. Uh, California Nanosystems Institute uh, was just established at that point. So they had our open doors and they are interdisciplinary as an institution within academia. And that's what I wanna talk about a little bit in this introduction to give you a sense of how we started working as a collective uh, to build a curriculum of third culture and meaning the two cultures of the art and science. My main uh, person that I was learning about when I was doing my PhD was Buckminster Fuller who called himself the anticipatory design scientist. And he was very much an engineer, a visionary, an architect thinking about natural systems in relation to everything in nature and in life. And later, uh, when I was finishing my PhD, I actually addressed these issues. I worked with Roy Ascot, who developed the Planetary Collegium. What I see happening now is that this Planetary Collegium vision that he had, that we all shared with him, is actually coming true. So the silver lining of this horrible pandemic that's global is that we are working globally and that some ideas that have not been able to get off the ground are actually doing that now. In a sense, uh, what Bianca Hoffman and Sabrina has are doing uh, is kind of enlivening this planetary collegium idea because the students uh, that are in Bremen are going to be talking to the students in Los Angeles, in New York, and who knows where, because we, we have a very large network of uh, people who, students who ended up going home. A lot of our students are international and during the pandemic, they had to go back to Korea, China. We have even uh, students in Europe. So that sharing will happen. And during this uh, uh, sessions that we're doing, I will definitely introduce students from all over the world. My personal inspiration also was uh, Nikola Tesla. Uh, when I was growing up in New York City, uh, the monument to Nikola Tesla was being built and my father was very obsessed with him. We're from ex-Yugoslavia. Uh, so we kept learning more about him, even uh, finding out where he lived, but he did. Some of these images of Nikola Tesla were so amazing and inspiring to me. And uh, I have to say that I am an artist because I had really bad science teachers. I actually really liked science, but the science teachers were so awful that I just ended up going to art. And now when I teach art and science classes, that I ask the science students, how was your art teacher? And they would go, oh, <laughs> terrible. They actually told me I couldn't draw and that I'm not talented. And that's why 
he's a scientist. So we have to fix this. And I ended up going on my own journey, learning science. And I think I still do. I know I think, I know I'm still learning. It, it never ends. Science is so amazing. And as an artist, I ask crazy questions. So it's an interesting collaboration. <laughs> Um, just as a little side note to the students, the reason we have wireless networks and technologies is because of Nikola Tesla, who had this vision and basically it's now coming true. So our motto at the UCLA Art Science Center is to think of the impossible, imagine the impossible, because what's impossible today becomes completely normal in 10, 20 years, who knows? And we really, really encourage that. So whenever you feel, or when somebody tells you that's impossible, take it as a sign. It's a good place to go. And as uh, uh, Bianca mentioned, I went to the Academy of Fine Arts in Belgrade and I actually went back to show you this because you can see how, how I shifted. So, I went to the school and this is pretty much the classroom I went to, which is related to medicine because we had to do anatomy for three years and we had to learn the Latin names of each bone and muscle and draw it. And this is actually, I'm grateful for, for this work now, but at that point it was really painful, incredibly boring. I was 18, I, all I wanted to do is go to concerts and hang out. And eventually I gave up and went to New York and formed a band. And that's me on the right <laughs> about 40 years ago. Um, and this is where I learned about music, sound, collaboration, media. And I just got excited about a different type of working rather than being an artist separate in my studio. And I went back and I finished, but I was completely changed because I had, um, I did concerts with, this is a record cover from a, a record we did that actually sold really well. And just the idea there was that you're on a path that's like a lightning thunderbolt. So that was, that was my background, just so you have an idea. And then I found this book a little later, The Consciousness of the Atom which totally blew me away. And again, learning these things without really good foundation of science gave me a kind of a different perspective and thinking about atomic energy and atoms. And the movies that influenced me were movies like Metropolis uh, that also were so visionary. So in, in the twenties, you're talking about uh, these visionary ideas that became kind of normal later. So this is the kind of my background a little bit. This is uh, Dr. James Jimjewski, who is our scientific director. And he couldn't join us. I actually asked him if he could say a few words, but he had another Zoom meeting. Um, so, but he gave me a couple of slides to share. He wanted to send his best regards to everybody and really encourage the students uh, to go on a path of the impossible because that's what he did. Uh, he came to UCLA in 2001. Uh, this is the slide he shared with me. That's uh, him and his mother and the place where they came from in Glasgow. He came from a very hard neighborhood and uh, he just had this will to fight through and to, to just get ahead in life. Uh, so he studied and he had these visions and everybody was saying, oh, you're a dreamer. And he said, I'm so glad I was a dreamer because my dreams came true. He was obsessed with these chemistry sets. And I actually found one that's very similar uh, from the 50s and 60s. This, this came as a box and then you get all these different uh, bits and you do your experiments at home. And then jump, jump, jump to uh, years later when he was at the IBM Zurich lab uh, where they got a Nobel prize for uh, actually developing and building the first scanning tunneling microscope. Uh, this I grabbed from him because these images are just so beautiful as an artwork to me. 
and this is what I kept uh, feeling with a lot of scientific imaging and, and scientists that I talked to, they, they're no different than artists. And, and it's true, a really good scientist is identical to a really good artist. Uh, Buckminster Fuller used to say, uh, the closer art gets, the, the more perfect art gets, it gets to science, and the more advanced science gets, it gets to be like art, and this is really true. So these are first scanning uh, tunneling images from a molecule, and as uh, Bianca Hoffman mentioned, we will take you on, on a tour of the labs at the California Nanosystems Institute, where we, we explain all these different um, uh, imaging machines. And uh, uh, the global hunt and our ultimate mission is to do the mission impossible. That's what we're gonna do together. So uh, jump to my search. I started with doing interviews with scientists asking them, how did you come up with your idea? So what you see is Glenn Seaborg, who came, uh, he actually discovered an element, Seaborgian, and he, he passed away already, but he announced this in a, a radio show. So it was like a game and he engaged the public in a really beautiful way. And then Mary Galman was just such a, an amazing person to talk to. So I just kept thinking, how do I, how do I make artists aware that these scientists are incredible and how do I create dialogues that I'm enjoying so luckily. Uh, and also I was so fortunate because of my, again, my own personal need to talk to scientists and create these videos and interviews. I ended up being recommended to do a, a CD-ROM at that time. I don't know if, if anybody even knows what a CD-ROM is from your generation. But those are this, these little round things that you put in a disc and you get to see digital stuff. Uh, so we were doing a, a Life in the Universe uh, and the Evolution of the Universe that was written by Stephen Hawking. I got to meet him, work with him, and it blew my mind. It was completely like, poof, because I suddenly realized that without the computer, and I wouldn't be able to communicate with this person. So you had this amazing uh, uh, moment at least for me where I realized that how much technology can enable and it's doing it right now. Right now I'm talking to you from the desert in California and we're having this conversation and our backgrounds are the same of the steam from, <laughs> from Brownhofer brain. So uh, a little bit about stereotypes. Um, this is kind of a stereotype of a scientist and another one that we all grow up with well, I've discovered that there's some pretty amazing black women who are scientists and uh, Latino men and that uh, not everybody's perfect and they can be amazing scientists. They're not all white crazy guys. Some are and that's cool, but not all of them are like that. Um, and not all artists are suffering guys who are just like, you know, uh, not, have no money and are just gonna die if they don't have like their vision. And not all artists cut off their ears and are, you know, also guys, I'm an artist, hello. <laughs> so, and then a little bit about institutions at the very beginning, just a reminder that our academia has outgrown of churches. So the churches actually then couldn't handle a lot of stuff that was being discovered. And slowly they started having these uh, buildings outside and then the buildings became more and more independent, but they're still around. And I'm sure in Europe, it's even more, but here we have like Harvard University, top blue, blue chip school. This is a chapel right on the university now, like we didn't change this. Uh, here's a church at Yale University, so another blue chip school. This is a lecture hall in Princeton, okay? I'm telling you about all universities that are blue chip high level in, in America. Here's the Harvard Library, right? 
So this is changing now and it's changing radically with the pandemic. The pandemic is just blowing this apart. We don't know how, but your generation is going to change it. And, and you should really also shape it and put your two cents into how we do this. Um, this is the school where we are on the one side uh, at the uh, UCLA. And I always ask the students, what does this look like to you? And they're like, hmm, uh, a corporate building? Yeah, actually. <laughs> so we're totally like a, a corporate building. And so is the California Nanosystems Institute on the other side of campus. So good or bad, it doesn't matter. It's no judgment, but we are in a corporate culture that's global and the architecture is showing it. And now we're shifting also to online because we have to. Uh, we don't have a choice. That little nano molecule, that little virus is deciding how our life is going to be. Um, so I think I'll stop here, maybe have a little bit of a dialogue, uh, think, uh, you know, and then I have more. I can talk all day. I won't, I promise, but I think I'll stop here. And then we can continue with the second part of what I wanted to share. So I was actually very curious to talk to Jan, Jan Bick, who is leading all these students. I wanted to get a sense uh, of what you're imagining, how you're envisioning uh, how this all proceeds so that we can work together and contribute as much as possible from our side, because I think this initiative is very important and exciting and it's going to, in a way, lead the way for others. So I'm mm. taking it very seriously. Yeah. Um, we, are, we are very excited here in BREM2. And um, to me, the whole thing, um, puts our learning here in our school on a whole new level. We never change the point of view or the, the way we um, connect to a topic, the way we're doing it right now. To connect art and digital medicine and the way we interact now, yeah, to combine all this to a new form of asking questions, learning, um, interact with each other, find new ways to communicate. And this is very exciting and I'm excited to find out how it turns out. Wonderful. And uh, Sabrina, what, what, what are your thoughts about what we're attempting to do here? Yeah, as usual. So uh, I, I'd like to, to work interdisciplinary. So, and not only interdisciplinary in our institute. So this is what we are used to. Yeah, we are used to working interdisciplinary with regards to science and with regards to ma mathematics, computer science, physics. Yeah, but it's also very interesting to get different viewpoints. Yeah, so to, to get different questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> Artists and scientists are posing very different questions, but you only see that when you are working with the other discipline. Yeah, so mm -hmm. this is, I, I really like that. <laughs> and this I is what encourages me. I agree with you completely. And, to, and I've noticed since we started the center when actually there was either no understanding or resistance or just thinking it's a waste of time to uh, scientists slowly being interested and artists being more interested to the point where it's almost overwhelming for us because the students want it. The students are saying, I want to be part of this. I want to do something. So we have to respond basically, but uh, there's a, a real need to ask these questions and the scientists actually are 
appreciating getting some weird questions from the artists like oh wait i didn't think of this this way <laughs> so, so it's a good thing yeah all right well i'll continue unless somebody has questions or you know anybody else uh from the group uh please feel free and if you feel uh shy to talk you can put your questions in the chat and I will answer. I'm paying attention to the chat. And also, um, Caitlin Bryson, who's the assistant at the Arts Eye Center, is here, so she can also help. And Ellie is here, too. So Ellie, why don't you say a few words before I continue? Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Thank you, Victoria, Bianca, and Sabrina for inviting me to be part of this initiative. I'm super excited also to work with all of you and see what ideas you have and questions you wanna ask. Um, from my experience during the residency, I was, I was really excited to work directly with, with the scientists and actually be able to ask them weird questions, like you said, Victoria, and kind of see a spark in their eyes. And, and they would be like, well, maybe we could use the tools that we have to try to answer this weird question that you have. So I think it's incredible, really, what happens when we these two parts of the brain or these two disciplines merge and the kind of maybe other imaginations that can be generated from it. So. I'm excited to see where this goes. And we have prepared a really exciting series of workshops for you. So i um, super stoked to see what we can make out of them. Cool. All right, so I'm gonna now continue. Uh, so here we go. And schreibt uns gerne eure Fragen auch auf Deutsch. Wir übersetzen gerne. Ja, also alles, was ihr auf dem Herzen habt oder fragen Sorry. möchtet. Sorry about that, I'm gonna, I went, here we go. All right, so one of the things we do is uh, the Artside Lab and Studio that also Ellie and Caitlin and John teach in, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but before I go into that, I just wanted to uh, say what was, and has been and continues to be my absolute fascination. And that's thinking about how to make the invisible visible, how to make the inaudible audible, the things that we don't hear. Because as humans, we have such a narrow, narrow track of what we see and hear. And if we connect to the animals like dogs, we can smell more through them. If we connect to the birds, we can go into the skies and get a sense of what's going on there. If we touch the ground, we can maybe feel something else going on. And all the different microscopies that are being developed now are letting us into these worlds so that we can expand our vision. Now that the virus is taking over, this virus is 140 nanometers. Okay, so it's, it really is invisible. And the problem with a lot of misunderstandings and, and uh, politics around this virus is because people don't understand the visible and the inaudible. So it becomes a really important thing to do. Uh, my personal uh, obsession for those who are into mathematics has always been into tetrahedrons, hexagons, colors, intervals, and sound waves. And I continue to, to think this way, how natural systems can be shown and represented. And again, Buckminster Fuller informed me on this. So for those of you who this name is new to, go online and you'll find, I'll actually put a link for that. Um, he built uh, this dome in 1967, and this was a sphere that was based on his ob observation of soap bubbles and natural systems, and, he, and it's absolutely mathematically amazing. Um, we're now jumping to 1985, where two scientists uh, discovered uh, this Buckminster fullerene, it's the third carbon molecule. And the way it was discovered was by the scientists looking at this and saying, you know, uh, I can't quite detect how these geometries look, but I remember that beautiful architecture and maybe that's how the math works. This is how it was discovered. It was literally by looking at architecture 
going back into the nanoscale with these new systems. So scanning tunneling microscopy, which we will get into more, uh, you have to kind of imagine that this finger is like an Eiffel Tower, right? Or a huge building. And the atom would be like a golf ball, right? How can we even imagine this? We, we can't. So the thing is to not try to even visualize it but in, in kind of a perfect way because we can't. So we have to bring it back into human language and human experience. Again, if you think of the finger on these atomic force microscopies or scanning tunneling microscopies, imagine that it's a fine needle terminated by a single atom. So again, our brains are not even wired to imagine these things. This is uh, something that was done in Jim Jevsky's lab where they actually took uh, the buckyballs, these molecules, and created an abacus with it. It actually was in the Guinness Book of World Records. It's the smallest abacus on the planet. And it worked really well. So you can actually see like a little animation here, I hope. Ah, it's not working, but the idea is that um, the, the abacus was moving, but then it disperses. And I, of all things, I love that. So he's like, oh yeah, but it dispersed. And I thought, oh wow, so nothing stays still. So nothing is fixed. That's pretty amazing. So when I'm taught in school about these things, they look like this, they're plastic balls that look like the stiff thing that stays in place when in fact it's this invisible vapor that moves all the time and disappears how do we visualize something like that and then he was doing research on uh, yeast cells with the same uh, atomic force microscopies and discovering that they're actually making sounds so for an artist, this is incredible. Like, oh, wow, we can actually make music with cells and yeast and water, wow. And then the scientists go, wait, that's true. So here's a moment. He, they discovered in the lab, Andrew Pelling was a PhD student of his who at that time who liked to do music on the side. And you find that most creative scientists actually do either music or draw or something in the closet. Um, so they saw this and they were really excited, like, wow, these cells are moving. But then they said, oh, if I show this to Victoria, she's going to go, she's not going to get it. They were right. <laughs> I would probably look at it and go, oh, I'm happy for you. That's great. That's, I'm so happy you got those results. But he said, why don't you, instead of giving her the images, she's a media artist, why don't you output it as sound? And it was, yeah, so they sped up the, and, and amplified it. And the next thing you know, they sent me an MP4 file of a, of a cell sound. And yes, I was impressed. I was like, what? This is amazing. So then they started thinking, wait, this is really interesting. We can actually detect things through sound. There's no reason that it has to be visual. So why don't we just start a whole thing? A paper came out, Sinocytology. And they start a whole, if you start doing search on people working with cells and sound, you will find people like Carla Ventura, who we just recently interviewed, who talks about cell sonics. So this is directly from relationship with an artist. And here's the Buckminster Fullerene, which directly goes from the architect, right? Because of when they looked, this is all they saw. They could not figure out that it's actually like this. In fact, it looks like a football. Um, it's identical to a football. And identical to how nature works with, with close packing systems, right? So these are hexagons and beehives and, and sound and social networks. So the complexity is what I'm also very much interested in when working with scientists who have to actually be reductionists when they're looking at one particular thing. We're trained to think comprehensively. So we're actually, even if you're looking at one molecule, 
we look at it as how does the complexity of it work? If you move that one molecule, how does it affect the rest of the world? And this, I wonder if you would guess what this is, this hexagonal pattern. And I'll tell you, uh, it is the uh, cell phone system. So what you're seeing here is cell phone towers and then hexagons around them. And each hexagon is owned by different company, et cetera. The point here that I want to make is that these engineers were using hexagons, not because of all the philosophies that I'm telling you, but because it's a most efficient system. So they just basically figured out what the bees figured out, what the nanotechnologies are figuring out, what nature knows. So the whole point is that we've, we've gone away so far with the industrial age from nature that we have to kind of return to these natural systems and patterns. And here you see the three different molecules, uh, the carbon molecules and the buckyball. And I will not go into it, but we did a number of different installations where people could enter into the molecular realm. And as we go along, I'll share some of those works with you. Here's another one where I actually figured out how to create an installation with buckyballs that are manipulated with your shadow. So you're actually shifting and moving and, and re-envisioning the whole thing because as I said, if you give me a plastic model of a, of, of a buckyball in my brain, it doesn't give me a sense that we're all made of molecules that it's all shifting and changing and interconnected. And then a little bit about the uh, environment and ecology and the work that I've been doing recently, I just wanted to share because it actually is connected. And uh, as we talk about medicine and media, and as we talk about uh, our bodies, we have to also talk about uh, natural systems. So this is a, a collaboration with Angevante in Vienna and uh, the scientific visualization department where they visualize these uh, planktons, 3D scan them, believe it or not, and uh, they were doing it for Terence McKenna's movie. So big movie production, big budget. They created seven of these amazing, uh, incredible actually planktons that again are so tiny. And it wasn't used in the movie. So I was asked, oh, can you do something with this? And I looked at it and I thought, well, how about we blow it up? to be as huge as a whale. <laughs> and they're like, what? <laughs> they're like, yeah, these planktons are amazing. And let's make them as important as whales, right? Uh, why do you want to do that? Well, actually I was wondering how does noise pollution affect planktons? And they're like, what? We never thought of that. So the research into that that wasn't really happening, but actually now we're starting to see that underwater noise pollution very much affects these creatures that are bottom of our food chain, right? And if you keep going up the food chain and get to whales and get to humans, that's really scary. If those, if the bottom of our food chain goes down, if the bottom of our food chain eats microplastics means we eat it. So to think in a holistic way about our body not separate from our environment became a very important thing for my work and my teaching. And here's for instance, an image of a plankton eating microplastics. So everybody knows biology enough to go up the ladder and understand what that means. It's a very scary thing going on. And I'll give you just a tiny little image of uh, uh, what's going on. So uh, 80% 80, 80%, let me just uh, let me just say something. 80% of the air we breathe is produced by plankton. We think forests. No, it's plankton. Every other breath you take is produced by plankton. And this is something that a lot of us don't know, that we're not taught. So this was uh, at Ars Electronica that is sponsoring this effort. So I wanted to show it.
Victoria, we have a question. It's not, um, we've passed it a little bit, but um, Omar asks, is medicine being researched and also used internationally or only in America? Medicine, I, would, I guess medicine. medicine, maybe medicine and media arts. Oh, is that yeah. what you mean, Omar? Let, let us um, maybe, uh, Umar, you, vielleicht kannst du das etwas kommentieren, was du mit uh, Medizin meinst. Meinst du die Forschung von Frau Nufa Mewis oder die Forschung am Nanolab? I will answer that in a second. Ellie was there. <laughs> and, and Bianca and Sabrina, I think. Were you there? Yes. Oh, that's me. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I just wanted to give you a sense and uh, I'm going to close my meeting. Actually, Omar, your question was perfect timing uh, because uh, I wanted to go into media and medicine and talk a little bit about uh, what we uh, had with Leonardo da Vinci uh, who, of course, we equate with Renaissance and art and science. And some of these pictures and, of his from his notebooks actually equate the, if you see this one in particular, uh, the, the arm and the veins in the arm are equated with rivers and how rivers flow. And uh, this is the deluge then he looks at natural systems in relation to the heart in particular and heart valves and, and different parts of nature. Um, this is Ellie's work. And Ellie uh, created a number of pieces. Uh, she did this in her first year of studies. This is a, a scaled up uh, uh, ice piece with a, um, pieces of um, different plants, absolutely gorgeous piece she'll tell you about. And she worked with me on a number of projects, including re we're still collaborating. So now we're, we're actually peers. She's not a student anymore. I have to remind myself from time to time. <laughs> I'm still a mentor of sorts, I guess. Uh, but we actually collaborate now. And here, the, what we're doing is um, uh, working with a uh, neuroscientist, um, who, uh, Dr. Cohen, uh, who helped us put together EEGs and uh, to have two people talk as uh, without verbs, nonverbal communication with um, octopuses. Another story I won't get into. And I will say a few words about this guy because we are in a pandemic uh, and to remind everybody of the size of this molecule, uh, molecule virus, 140 nanometers. I mean, it is just mind blowing and the, that can have such an impact on our lives and how important media is and medicine is in our world. Um, we created a piece um, at the Natural History Museum in Vienna that dealt with meteorites and micrometeorites. So every day, a hundred tons of dust falls on earth that's from outer space, even outside of our solar system. And we're not aware of this, but every day also this dust mis mixes with pollution and pollens and different dust. So the whole, pieces about this complexity and how we're part of this larger solar system. And to answer Amar's question, uh, the, the me medicine and media arts is becoming a very international effort. Um, last year, we had a conference on medicine and media arts um, 
about Leonardo da Vinci and it was called Inventing the Future, Flight, Automata, Art, Anatomy and Biomorphism. What I would like to stress here is that it was actually uh, initiated by surgeons in London and uh, UCLA and all around the world, uh, scientists and medical doctors who started looking at what Leonardo did in the past. And we, um, we already had a precedent, so we started working together on this because um, about uh, almost 10 years ago, we had a conference called Art and Brain. And here we were, again, looking at uh, structures and stories and how we invent stories. So media is so important because you can see, you can see how things are uh, communicated to the world or not communicated enough. And so that to think about stories and structures is critical. This was in collab collaboration with Patricia Olinick, who's at the Washington University in St. Louis, and she works there with a medical school directly. They actually are working together. That medical school now and her art program is connected to us and we're starting a media, a medicine and media arts program and she's going to be our first fellow. So this uh, class actually becomes exactly, uh, comes together exactly at the time that we're creating this program. And so Patricia Olenek uh, will certainly uh, join and at some point and uh, will share what she's doing too. And it will very much be an international effort and you are part of it. Uh, here's another image that I think is uh, fascinating. This is a model from UCLA. And uh, what the uh, surgeons are discovering is that a lot of the drawings here that Leonardo did actually were absolutely precise. So they're just amazed that this is happening. Uh, and then we go to space and we think about a new, technologies uh, and our body in space. Of course, we're going to Mars. And some people would ask, well, why are we going to Mars when there's so many problems here? Actually, each time we do something like that, that's crazy and impossible, we're bringing back that knowledge down to earth to our bodies and to our lives. So Renaissance happened after the Black Plague. The Black Plague uh, was such a horrible time and some people compare the Spanish flu and Black Plague to what's going on with the pandemic. And possibly it, it's a thing that may happen. Certainly a lot of the old systems are crashing, including the educational system, including the everything, right? Everything is just go going upside down. And the thing to do now especially for your generation, is to project and imagine what this Renaissance would be. Ren the word Renaissance, by the way, is French re, to, to renew, and naissance is birth. So what is the new thing that will birth out of this time? And, and to use it as an opportunity where things have stopped, the oceans are quiet, because there's less traffic, the skies are quieter. It's a, it's a time when you have in this education, as much as it's a, it's a drag on many levels, but for all of us, we can stop and look to the skies and look to the earth and really think about our bodies and our health. And the health is the most important thing now to think about. There's nothing more important because there's so many people sick and dying and it's, it's a virus that we don't understand. We have to find out more. We have to figure out what's invisible, what's inaudible and understand it better and communicate that to people who don't understand it and they're acting crazy. We need to explain this. And this is why this program is really fantastic. Um, please sign up for our mailing list and um, I'll stop sharing there. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Victoria. So. Uh, my pleasure, my pleasure. <laughs>
So please, if you have any questions, um, Uma, is your question answered hereby? You referred to research uh, in general. I think I answered the question. Uh, we definitely, it's an international effort. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Actually, Omer, yeah. you asked exactly when I was about to move into the me medicine and media part. So of what we I was have wondering. here from uh, Chelsea. Chelsea. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So are there things? Chelsea. Yeah, are there things you have created to help people with disabilities? For example, something similar to the octopus device for people who can't hear or see. Yes, so we, uh, Aysen Karu Shasin is a, a, a ex-student who was in a PhD program that I was visiting professor in in Scuba in Japan. The program was called Empowerment Informatics Program and they were very much focusing on creating devices, especially for disabilities. So they, mm -hmm. they created these amazing devices for people who couldn't walk or see, etc. And now she's uh, at the University of Texas uh, Medical School. She's actually very much part of this program that we're building. Uh, so during her time as a student, I met her at uh, Parsons when I was there in New York, she was building devices and it was very much media devices and cute and fun and lots of games. And then as the PhD program went on and she started being aware of older people and disabilities, she started thinking about, well, what do you do with people who can't see or hear? And uh, now she's in charge of prototype lab for medical devices, specifically for disabilities. This is a big effort and um, we, we're very much wanting that to be part of our education and part of what we do. Absolutely. So if you're interested more in that, uh, I can definitely get you in touch with Aysen directly. And she would actually be wonderful, uh, Bianca, to give a talk for this group. She also teaches in our SciArt program. Okay, good to know. Any more questions? So you I can post it in the chat if you have. Yeah, also uh, we will have an X learning access and um, we can have an ongoing discussion. So the idea is to have a block there and that uh, you all have a possibility to reflect and write on some thoughts and that we also can interact uh, later the evening or the next day. So uh, this is not gone. Also, we are recording this so you can rewatch it and uh, share it with uh, other school students who could not join this evening. Um, I think let's have a look at the time. Sabrina, do you want to say some words uh, about tomorrow or how do we want to proceed? Yeah, yeah, can do that. So tomorrow uh, will be our first excursion uh, to our MRI lab, also magnetic, mag magnetic resonance imaging lab uh, in Bremen. So we have an MRI scanner device uh, with which you can um, acquire images, digital images, and we will see uh, we will acquire by tomorrow. And this will be done by a colleague uh, called Jochen Hirsch. And um, as Bianca already mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, we are starting with uh, some more examples uh, from our um, yeah, work at the intersection of um, arts and science, and then going directly into uh, yeah, the scanner tour. Let's, let's really call it a tour because our colleague really guides you into the scanner room virtually, but he will guide you into that. <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, tomorrow at the same time. Okay. Same time, same place, so to say. Please, uh, you can all save this chat. So um, Victoria shared also a link, but we can also share it with Jan and he can post it again. If you go in the chat uh, on the bottom on the right side, there's files and then there are three 
little dots and there you uh, could save the chat. And Ellie has a reminder for us, just a quick reminder for those who have not filled out the anonymous equipment form, please do so tonight. I regret it will greatly help me to know what kind of devices you have access to so I can plan the hands-on workshop. So for those of you who have not filled in this poll, you can copy paste here the link. And also Jan had provided it as far as I know. And maybe not in, in, uh, maybe in addition to what Sabrina just mentioned, I will also give a brief idea about what the main mission at Fraunhofer Mavis, the research we are doing uh, is about. So I hope to see you tomorrow, same time. If anything is left, now is the time to place it. Victoria, Jan. Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe one point. So. Um, Maybe uh, I have not said it in that detail before. Uh, in detail before. So, um, the oh, Sabrina, we've lost you. You're frozen. In the three team evenings, there will be. Wait, wait a second. Yes, and I, you have I, to repeat. You were frozen. Yeah, I, I, I know. Okay. So I, I, I just wanted to mention that. Uh, each and each evening, uh, we will have have hands-on sessions. So this is not that we have only talks or only discussions. So you, yeah. So I, I take over, Sabrina. You're frozen again, but it's an important really point. Yeah, hands-on. Can do something. Yeah. Sometimes I'm struggling. Yeah, I don't know what what is here with my internet connection. Yeah, it was a little data, but I think the point is made. So for the school students, okay. uh, you can really work on your own offline and online. And uh, the first evening we even um, deal with uh, AR and possibilities with a computer, but also with drawing. So um, good point, Sabrina. Thanks. Victoria, you wanted to say something. I just wanted to say thank you for including us. This is very exciting. Yeah, we are also very excited. <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to these evenings, especially for you, because that's mornings for me. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to the uh, school students who were so keen and put some uh, questions in the chat. So this yes. is well, really thank you so much. It's going to be a great ride. All right. OK, yeah. see you tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.